So, uh, yes, as Oscar Mill introduced me, I'm Calvin. I'm a first year undergraduate at Corpus, which is obviously the best college. And over the past three years, I've been working uh, on optical metamaterials. So why, for starters, why um, would randomly during GCSEs they suddenly decide these, these are a brilliant thing I should start looking at. Um, so for ages, I've been, wait a second, I should check, can everyone hear me? <laughs> I, before I get to, before I get started and find no one heard me throughout. I see, I see. cool, thanks Isaac. If anyone can't hear, just put it in the chat. Okay, so, so basically for years and years, I've been really, really interested in holograms and sort of thought about tons of different ideas of how to make them just random things and initially based off of something a physics teacher told me i decided that the the way that would make it all work is if you shine two lasers at one another you'd get a point of light at the center which just doesn't happen um and sort of i kept i always had holography in the back of my mind and one day i was looking at a wikipedia page and uh it down the side of the page had something about a material with a really, really weird property, this uh, weird metamaterial thing, a, a ne negative index metamaterial. And um, it seems like this was exactly the thing I've been looking for to do something which had otherwise seemed impossible to do nicely. And so that's why I've been, since this, since that time, I've been really, really interested in metamaterials because they seem like a, they, they're a way of doing stuff that's almost impossible, stuff that is, it's not impossible. The laws of physics allow it, and we know the laws of physics allow it, but stuff that's not seen anywhere naturally in the world. And this is why I'm really excited about them. That's why I'm giving this talk. And hopefully by the end, some of that will have vaguely infected you. Um, so I promised at some point a flying donut. That is the top left up here. We've got a flying donut. This is, uh, this is another example of uh, something which never found in nature but which metamaterials allow us to achieve. So the flying donut is, it's the analog for light of uh, smoke rings in the air or dolphins have been known to blow bubbles into rings and play with them. And the idea that was theorized is you can have in theory toroidal oscillations of electromagnetic waves. Can we make them with light? And people theor did some theorizing, showed they had some interesting properties, but they're not found anywhere in the world. So how do I, how do I create a sheet of some material that when I shine a plane wave at it, gives me something that we never see naturally? And so this is the sort of thing, this is precisely the sort of thing that metamaterials are really good at. And I won't pretend to completely understand the flying donuts because there's a lot of uh, math that's way beyond me for that. Um, okay. So I've discussed, I've like said, metamaterials now, they're brilliant. They can do these impossible things that are found nowhere in nature. And I have given you no information whatsoever about what a metamaterial is. So what is a metamaterial? So when thinking about what a metamaterial is, I try and begin by, I sort of feel metamaterials are almost a way of thinking about materials. So, and certainly physically, they can, you can have something that's a metamaterial and is visibly indistinguishable from a normal material because it's almost the way it's designed that makes it what it is. So just for looking at what a uh, metamaterial, uh, what a metamaterial is. So for a long time, we've been interested in tools. Many millennia ago, a caveman, caveman picked up a stick and decided he'd rub it against something or maybe throw it at a nearby gazelle. So the gazelle found brilliant. He's got a useful, useful thing. He made a tool and Eventually, he began realizing that, hey, we rather than just relying on finding this stick, we can craft these tools out of raw materials. Brilliant. Um, eventually, though, these raw materials weren't necessarily uh, enough. He wanted materials with different properties. And so at this point, we get the idea of composite materials or just processing materials. And typically, the idea behind this is we have we look around, we see there are these existing materials with these existing properties, and we sort of interpolate or extrapolate properties of different materials. Maybe we get lucky and we stumble upon something, so we find that adding a tiny amount of carbon to our iron suddenly makes it load stronger, and we end up coming up with a theory for that. But it's all very driven by seeing things that already exist in the world. 
then there's the case of, OK, what happens when we run out of materials? Um, what happens when the existing materials don't do what we do and don't do what we want them to do? And at this stage, we can start looking at uh, artificial materials. So these uh, in optics in particular, they started coming to the fore um, in uh, in the 20th century, um, because amongst other things, people began to realize that if you wanted to interact with, say, uh, really long wave electromagnetic radiation, which is brilliant if you, say, want to interfere with radar, um, we can, in theory, design, we can create artificial materials with our own sort of atom-like things by taking uh, taking some substrate and just embedding these atoms in it. And people began to sort of start testing with these atoms. But eventually, this led us on to the topic of this talk, which is rather everything up to this point has been looking at materials that exist in the world, maybe trying to make ones and then recording their properties, coming up with a theory that explains those properties and using that to maybe extrapolate or interpolate a little bit. Metamaterials, to me at least, feel like a, a break from that sort of way of looking at things, because with a metamaterial, you go the other direction. You begin with what is a complete sort of description of the physics? And with this complete description of the physics, if I could just design an atom, what would that atom do? What properties would that atom have? And how would I use that to make a material? And so this is sort of the idea of metamaterials. We take a property and we build meta atoms or meta molecules, which sort of fulfill this property. And we try and build that into a particular material. Um, OK, so for a very slight example of this, um, let's say that I want to I want to create a metamaterial that interferes with, say, refraction. This has a weird refractive index. Maybe it's an extremely high refractive index. So I know that refractive index is somehow related to resonance with light, and I can find that, say, this particular thing. It's a small harmonica. Uh, let's say let's say I mean that resonates with air. Maybe we can work out a theory that says. Brilliant, this resonates with light as well. I mean, everything does to some extent. And I'm going to use these as my atoms, so I'm just going to place loads of these next to one another in an array. Now, is this a metamaterial? Or is this even a single material? And this is where it's sort of interesting to think about what makes a material a material. If we're going to say something's a single material, what we really want to have is some idea of continuity, some idea of I can sort of move my head a tiny bit, an infinitesimal amount, and I won't be able to distinguish it, it from something else. But obviously, this is, a, in a huge, a huge way, a function of what we're using to measure. So for instance, if I measure a sheet of copper or were to take a measurement of uh, this tiny harmonica using x-rays, then I'd, start, I'd see the fraction pattern. I'd, there'd be some breaking of the translational symmetry. Um, however, if I just look at this with light and I maybe just look at uh, the tiny, a tiny section of it with light, then this seems pretty smooth. If I translate it, you can't tell as long as you're just staring at a small enough section. And with microwaves, this entire thing, or radar, this entire thing, uh, if you place loads of them together, would just look like a single meta atom. It would just like a, look like a single material. So we want to somehow find a way of saying, okay, when does this act as a whole cohesive material? And when does it act as loads of tiny metal atoms. And so for this, we're going to get to the idea of diffraction. So diffraction is pretty much the main way we're going to see a translational, we're going to see a breaking of translational symmetry in the measurement. Um, and we know that diffraction is heavily, uh, it's heavily related to the wavelength of light. So this explains why this may act as a metamaterial for, uh, I could use this as a meta atom for creating a metamaterial for microwaves, but I might not be able to use it for uh, creating one for light because this is on the order of the wavelength of microwaves, not on the order of wave the wavelengths of visible light, and certainly not for, say, x-rays. And so how can we avoid diffraction? Well, the simple answer is we just make this smaller than the diffraction limit. But that always bugs me because, like, what physically is the diffraction limit? OK, that's a cross on top of it. Um, so the diffraction limit, for those who don't know, a uh, short introduction, because I think it's cool when this will come back later to be helpful, is uh, the diffraction limit is we take a wave, um, 
in this instance, imagine this wave were um, centered, were not uh, sine squared, but were just sine or just cosine, um, uh, and were centered around zero. And we have the property um, of electric fields. When an electric field moves from one medium to another, it's always got to be continuous across the boundary. Um, or at least the components lying along the boundary must be continuous. Now, what this means is if we're looking at something, if we're observing a material and we are in the air, then the light rays coming off that material are going to be, they can be uniquely sort of, I don't know, defined by uh, their phase, by their frequency and by their wave vector. Um, or a single plane wave can be anyway. And we know these have to match the boundary. So if these have to match the boundary, well, we know the frequency must match. And we know uh, K, uh, the X component, and if we're assuming the medium has a normal in the Z direction, the X component and the Y component of the wave vector must also match across the boundary. But what we also know is that all these properties must obey the relation, uh, a Pythagorean relation, KX squared plus KY squared plus KZ squared equals omega squared over C squared. And the diffraction grating comes uh, from the case where K squared Oh, sorry, the diffraction limit comes from the case where k squared x plus k squared y is already greater than omega squared over c squared, meaning that k squared over z has to be imaginary. And what this means physically in terms of waves is that suddenly, rather than having a progressive traveling wave coming away from your medium, instead you have an exponentially decaying wave. It still oscillates in time, but it transmits no energy. There are no peaks you can sort of watch and see a given peak is sort of traveling in one direction it's just an entire uh, exponential waveform sort of oscillating up and down um and so this is the sort of physically why the diffraction limit occurs and for those of you who are concerned that i'm just sort of solving an equation by inserting complex numbers which isn't like physically helpful um the the complex the use of complex numbers does work uh, within the wave equation and so and so we get the idea that maybe if I make something really small, maybe just maybe we'll be able to mess with things. So let's say we want to mess with refraction. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted my negative index metamaterial for, for holograms. Uh, for the sake of this, let's just quickly say we want something that has an insanely high refractive index. We want to make the next diamond. So diamonds refractive index of what, 2.4, something like that. We want this, we want some, something with five, so it's really sparkly. And so in order to do this, we could go about just finding existing materials. We could try doping diamonds or we could try doing, taking the metamaterial approach and we can try to truly mess with the, with the process of refraction. So how do we do this? Well, we begin with Maxwell's equations and we begin by saying, OK, we want the sort of Maxwell's equations uh, we get when light's traveling in a medium. And to simplify things, we're going to say this medium only interacts with the electric field. This may seem arbitrary, but it's a pretty good, uh, pretty standard approximation that almost all media around us will fulfill. And then we're going to make the approximation that um, the polarization is linearly related to the electric field. In general, this isn't true, but for pretty much everything uh, you come across at sort of reasonable intensities of light, this is going to be true. And this gets us the following equation. And uh, if you were to follow through, you'd find you'd get a wave equation. If you follow through on the algebra, um, then you'd get a wave equation with this term for uh, 1 divided by c squared, where 1 divided by c squared is the wave speed. And now I've used c squared twice, but 1 divided by v squared is equal to 1 plus chi divided by c squared, which means that we end up with a value for the refractive index. Don't ask what's happened with that for. I don't know. Um, we end up with a value for the refractive index of the square root of 1 plus chi, where chi is sort of our proportionality constant between the um, polarization and the electric field. Now, there are a couple of really interesting things to note here. Firstly, some of you may be wondering, where did this come from? You may, because we only had n squared in the final wave equation. In the wave equation, you only have a one over v squared. You don't actually actually ever have v, which is important because waves can propagate in more than one direction. So where has this, uh, where's this square root? Where's the positive sign of this square root come from? And it turns out that, well, for plane waves uh, traveling in a single medium, there's actually no difference 
uh, for a positive or negative n. We can see that by looking at the wave equation. But there is when you move between different media. And it turns out that for, uh, that for electric media, uh, by looking at the boundary conditions, we can distinguish the sign of n. And we, in this case, find that it's positive. Um, then we can also take a look at the second equation, because this is where things get really interesting. Because here we have this linear relationship between the polarization and the electric field. But what's really interesting to me about this relationship is it doesn't require any degree of causality. So for instance, if I take, do I have a pen? I've got a pen. If I take this pen and I move back and forth, there's no way of determining, given uh, the position of my hand and the position um, and the velocity of my hand, uh, how the pen will be moving, because it depends on how long I've been sort of wiggling it back and forth, but there are transients and they're not instantaneously causally connected. There's this idea of hysteresis. Um, the longer I spend this, the more it's going to resonate, the more energy it will take in, etc. And what this means is the fact that these two, there's no requirement that they be causally connected means in theory, we can use resonant systems. So naturally, um, if we were to think about um, if we were to think about values of chi, we might come across normally, we'd think about, say, uh, their use in a capacitor, where we assume we've got a material of a fixed uh, susceptibility or a fixed value for the relative, uh, for the relative permittivity. But it doesn't, but the thing this equation tells us is this doesn't have to be true for just static fields. We can use and to some extent abuse resonance. And this means that just as when I'm going, uh, shaking my pen back and forth, I can reach a very, very fast state where um, very nearly the pen is perfectly out of phase uh, with my hands. We can actually have negative values for chi. We can have complex values for chi. And those do substitute in and we do get um, potentially complex values for the refractive index, which co corresponds to attenuation of the medium. Um, and so, but how do we do this in practice? Well, as the slide sort of gives away, if I want to start messing with the polarization in the electric field, how can I do it? We've already established that capacitors sort of seem to be well connected to this because a capacitor, you apply an electric field or a voltage across the two plates of the capacitor and you get a charge buildup or a polarization. And so this seems to be something quite useful. But if you were to actually work through the maths and just work out, I'm placing a sort of capacitor, just two plates with a medium in between them, um, as a meta atom in my medium, you find out that all we're getting is the susceptibility of the material in between the two plates, which makes a degree of sense. Um, because if you have a medium that's just made out of a material of one susceptibility, your medium as a whole is going to have that susceptibility. But what we can then do is we can we can add something else in. We can make this a resonant system rather than simply just saying I've got a spring and I'm pulling that spring. We can say I've got a spring and I've got a mass on it and I'm applying some time varying force and we can hit resonance. And so how do we add a mass into our system here? We can use an inductor. And so now we can take a, we can make a circuit which is a capacitor plus an inductor and annoyingly some inherent resistance. And we can use this to basically tune our value of chi. Now, it would be a perfectly valid thing to think at this stage. OK, that's great in theory, um, but you've got to make capacitors and inductors that are that small. We know capacitors are loops of wire over and over again, and you need to have some sort of insulation between the various loops of wire because otherwise it will just conduct like a hollow wire and everything will be sad. Um, OK, and so we have to deal. We have to find a way of dealing with that. Um, and it turns out, as we will see in a few slides time, as you just saw me checking ahead there, um, there's quite an um, there's quite a neat way we can deal with this. But there's also the question of what I really wanted was I mentioned a negative index metamaterial. What do I mean by that? Uh, by a negative index metamaterial, I mean something that has a refractive index of minus one. This has some cool properties. Because what I was looking at when I was discussing holograms is I was discussing, well, I've got a lens, a circular lens here, um, and I've got a point of light down here. And the point of light, if I want to make a hologram, I can make a hologram with a single point of light because the point of light is going to 
go up, hit at most the edge of the lens, and then refocus somewhere further up. And I can make a hologram based off of that idea. Um, the downside is the fact that there's a limited field of view you can see at any one point in time um, from, from the hologram because there's only a certain solid angle subtended between the point of emission and the lens, and the lens can only capture light within that. And if you deviate from the optical axis, you begin to get aberrations. Whereas if you were to just take a single, um, a single sort of flat boundary, imagine you could send light into this boundary and it would just go back uh, in precisely the opposite direction. Within negative index metamaterials or metamaterials with a negative index of specifically minus one, you get no absorption because you get perfect matching at the phase boundaries, but you get a perfect swap in direction. And so these have the ability to focus light. And so I was really interested in them. So how do we go about getting this negative index? Well, it turns out this comes down to that assumption we made earlier, which was the assumption of the positive sign of N. Now, it turns out, what's that true for purely electric materials? It's not true for purely magnetic materials. And by taking various limits and considering boundary conditions, you can see that if you have the real part of the electric susceptibility and the real part of the magnetic permeability, both less than zero, then you can end up with a metamaterial that actually has a negative refractive index that takes light and does the weird and apparently impossible. It's um, Snell's, Snell's law suddenly becomes um, theta, uh, theta i equals minus theta r. And this is what I love about metamaterials. It's this idea that this occurs nowhere in nature. Pretty much everything in nature, certainly at optical frequencies, um, has has a um, has a refractive index that's significantly greater than uh, that's not significantly greater than zero. That's always greater than zero. Typically, always greater than one. And this just blows that out of the water by using a negative chi as even um, even in the case of just a solely electric material, if your chi is equal to minus one, we can suddenly have a refractive index of effectively zero. Um, and so there's there are lots of amazing effects we can get out of this. Um, and so how do we achieve this? Um, how do we achieve the, this? Because I've, I've prophesied we can get negative refractive indices. How do we build it? Well, sort of, can I, if I'm zooming in, does this zoom in for everyone? I can't tell. Um, if someone could let me know in chat, that'd be brilliant. I've yeah. just tried to zoom in. It does, yeah, brilliant. It does zoom in. Um, okay, so if we take a look at these structures here, this is the solution to the question I posed a minute ago, which is how do we get an inductor and a capacitor in one circuit at once, uh, in one circuit at once and on the, uh, a tiny scale? Now, this is okay, we can see we have some items, that inches, that's inches, why would you measure that in inches? Um, uh, to some, so we can see the scale of this, this isn't exactly on the nano scale. We can see this circuit alone acts as simultaneously an inductor and a capacitor. This acts as an LC resonant circuit. This is known as a split ring resonator. And the idea is basically we start with a, with a circle because a circle can couple to a magnetic field uh, uh, because magnetic field in there induces a current around it. And that current itself has an associated magnetic moment. But we, what we can also do is we can then place a split in that because like the simplest iteration of a capacitor is basically just two wires that aren't connected. And so by introducing a small split, uh, we can get something that's a split ring and that resonates. And this is the useful properties that it can connect with both the electric and the magnetic field. Because an electric field across the, uh, across the gap at the top will induce a current and will induce uh, charge, and, uh, charge and polarization. And a magnetic field going through the center will also induce a current or a rate of change of magnetic field through the center will induce a voltage which induces a current. Um, and so we end up with this concept of these really cool things called split ring resonators. And this is an example of um, this is an example of a negative refractive index metamaterial um, carried out at the microwave length scale. Um, so coming back to these these negative index metamaterials because they're really cool. We've got the or coming back to this idea of a lens. We've effectively created at this stage a perfect lens, and this is some quite cool properties. So the most obvious is that rather than most lenses, which can only image something on the optical axis at any particular time, this can suddenly image an entire plane of points or an entire 3D volume of points. It can image, it can collect light from and refocus that light all simultaneously. 
But that's not the only interesting and really cool thing. I, I've got an image to show that. Um, so it's it takes the image, in this instance, letter I, uh, takes the objects, this instance, letter I, letter I, sorry, uh, Snell's law uh, causes the refraction here, it reforms the image, and it can then reform the image again outside. Now, this is good, but this isn't where it ends. So the really nice thing is, that's a spoiler, sorry. Um, we, can consider we can consider lenses as having one particular job, the job of reconstructing phase. Um, because basically what a lens does is up to a, is, as light moves from a point up to some boundary, it's gonna have phase, a, a phase change applied to it uh, to get to any particular position and also some strength electric fields. And that uniquely determines how the light will propagate and also includes all the information about what the light originally was. So in theory, we can use a lens to reconstruct that. Now, um, and the way we can say we reconstruct it is we basically fix the phase. We know that there's been a phase difference applied somehow. We know that's related to the path it takes. And in this instance, we know the path it takes uh, has some spherical symmetry about the optical axis, which explains why lens, uh, let's say spherical symmetry, circular rotational symmetry about the optical axis, which explains why uh, lenses are always rotationally symmetric, or if they're trying to image stuff, they are. Um, but this has this has something quite cool because if you substitute in and go through all the equations, uh, you end up finding out that the condition at which the light within the medium uh, matches the light at the boundary of the medium is when they've got the same wave vectors kx and ky. We know that from before, but it also has the negative of the of the wave vector kz. Now, what this means is that for a traveling wave, it's going to go through and it's going to undo the phase change. In fact, the value for the phase, uh, and it will have the value for the phase that basically means at this point, if the light was um, initially all in phase, it will return to being all in phase at the particular point we observe it, which is an amazing property. But the coolest property out of all of this, and this is the reason I stress the diffraction limit thing so much earlier, is that not only can it retrieve the traveling waves, it can also retrieve evanescent waves. So the waves that look something like this, here we've got our boundary, and here we see them decay. And if I were measuring with an optical microscope here, there would be no hope we'd be able to see this. But if you place a negative index metamaterial here, the same thing about swapping the sign of Kz also, or Kz times Z, uh, also occurs here. But in the case of an evanescent wave, that means that it builds it back up. And so this idea for a perfect lens was what sparked pretty much the entire field of metamaterials. It was a paper published by John Pendry two days before I was born, which I think is just really cool. Um, and yeah, it's an, it's an amazing result. And it sort of shows what we can do with metamaterials. We can, using metamaterials, we can take something that's so fundamental, the refraction limit, come on, I mean, metamaterials even work using the diffraction limit, which leads you into an interesting catch-22 if you're not careful. Um, and somehow using these metamaterials, we've managed to design and to just using small resonant circuits that we just get smaller and smaller and smaller until you're printing them using um, electron microscopes. You can, uh, you can print them on the nanoscale. We can print these. It's been, it's been managed with um, as a about 10 years ago, I know, at least uh, 780 nanometer light, uh, paper by Gunnar Toling, which is the one that got me started on all of this. Um, yeah, we can, we can have this sort of amazing, really, really strange effect. Um, and yes, this all comes down to split ring resonators. This is taken uh, from a paper from Nature, and I just thought it's worth highlighting the structures which I saw had some resemblance to a split ring resonator. This is called the double fishnet structure. It's um, a 3D structure that's been used extensively to try and get um, negative indices of refraction, and it's layered into 3D because it helps if our, uh, because your lens needs to have a certain thickness in order to recombine the light at some point within it. Um, but yes, this is, a, I think this is so amazing. It's metamaterials and this sort of physics of metamaterials meant that rather than just where the field of artificial materials initially began with just embedding small particles in the substrate, we're still embedding small particles in the substrate, but we've come up with this amazing particle that does so much and has an insane amount of potential. Um,
And then from this, so um, in in the chat, I've seen him here already. There's a man by the name of Angelos Somalis. Um, I went to, uh, I've been two years in a row now to Southampton. And after the first year, he ran away and uh, left. Turns out for Cambridge, so we didn't get very far. Um, but um, I was, yeah, I was fortunate enough to get to go down and shadow them. And at this point in time, I'd been done with exactly what this talk has done so far. I'd been so focused on negative index meta materials, and I just, I wanted to build my hologram. I just wanted something with a negative refractive index. And this was the point where I really began to see, wait a second, light interacts with stuff in a lot of ways. And it's not just, it's not simple. There's so much stuff you can do. There's so much, it's complicated, but that means there's so much potential. And one area with a lot of potential um, is linear optical computing. And that is, that's where I've been looking because after about a year of researching negative index meta materials, I realized there's a very good reason that no one's done these yet. And that's that your unit cell has to be on the order of the wave wavelength of light. And in order to make a hologram out of this, you're going to need uh, the volume of your meta material to be on the order of the volume of your hologram, which means that you'd be talking trillions and trillions and trillions um, of unit cells needed to uh, reconstruct a hologram that's a few, that's a cube a centimeter or so square. Um, so it's not hugely practical. But what this led me to was this idea of, uh, li of linear optical computing. And this then entertained me for the next year, pretty much. Um, and uh, this, is, this is taken from a paper by, uh, the, by this group at Southampton University. Um, and it's basically, um, it's using light to perform optical, to perform um, logic gate operations. Now, why is this so interesting? Well, one thing that makes it really interesting is the fact that currently we transmit all of our signals by light. And if we're going to be transmitting signals by light, it makes sense to at the very least start looking at, well, maybe we can process them. In fact, it makes even more sense, voice break there, it makes even more sense to start looking at this uh, when we begin to realize that there's a huge energy penalty associated with converting signals from light into electricity uh, from light for transmission to electricity for processing and if we could get around this and avoid this that would be brilliant and so this brings us on to the idea of linear optical computing but linear optical computing also promises something else that's really cool which is transistors are fundamentally limited to my limited understanding at the very least um by the time it takes electrons to physically flow across a small gap the depletion region um if the electrons don't have time to flow across the gap, the transistor won't operate, and that limits the range of frequencies at which the transistor will operate, which is the reason why your computers have a limited speed. And there's a fundamental limit to the speed we can get with transistors and uh, modern methods of engineering. The cool thing is that linear optics, in particular uh, plasmonic linear optics, which is the case where you have a very thin material that only interacts with the electric field, theoretically allows you to get a thousand times faster. So, um, so this idea of linear optics has uh, led, um, led to this particular discovery and then to me spending a lot of time researching this vaguely obsessively, um, led to this idea of producing, can we produce optical logic gates? It turns out we can, sort of. Um, the limitation is that we're trying to use linear optics, as is implied by the title of linear optical computing. Why are we trying to use linear optics? We're trying to use linear optics because linear optics requires very low electric fields. So I mentioned earlier that everything around, around us um, typically obeys linear optics. And the reason why it does that is basically just a first order Taylor series expansion. It's all going to obey linear optics because electric fields typically aren't that strong and the second order nonlinear component um, so the polarization response due to an electric field is typically quite low. There are counterexamples to that, but the best counterexample I know of requires you to um, to build your meta to build a metamaterial out of superconductors, which sort of defeats the object of trying to build something at very low powers. Um, and so, linear optical computing is the way is a good way forward to look at for for low powers. The issue with this is that linear optics really doesn't like doing logic gates. Um, and the reason is the reason's fairly simple. If I take 
if I take, let's say, an XOR or gate. Uh, so an XOR or gate is an exclusive or gate. For those who don't know, it's um, it returns one if and only if one of the inputs is one. It will not return one if both of the inputs are one or if both of them are zero. Um, and we can design this reasonably simply. We can design a gate that pretty much does this with the emphasis on the word pretty much. Um, the gate, as, des as described in this particular paper, uh, manage this by taking two beams of light and effectively just superimposing them. But you superimpose, you superimpose the negative of one on the positive of the other. Um, and how does this help? Well, if they're both, uh, assuming they're both normalized to the same intensity, if they're both on, they're going to cancel out. If they're both off, it's going to be zero. If one's on, you're going to measure one. And if the, uh, if the other's on, you're going to measure minus one, which means that if you measure the intensity, you always get a constant intensity. Now, the annoying thing is that there's no way of placing these gates in series. I've read a couple of papers um, claiming they can, but I've seen as of yet no actual evidence that they can um, because of this fundamental limitation. Um, and this is the fact that basically uh, in doing this, you lose control of some of the phase. It, you can have your perfect XOR or, or gate in terms of intensity, but you lose information about the phase and the gate relies on you knowing the intensity to work. Um, so there are inherent problems with this, but it's a very powerful technique. And this also allows them to uh, to carry out uh, cryptography solely using linear optics and to uh, to design to design a well, to design an in-fiber cryptographic system for encryption and decryption. Um, and the final thing I'd sort of want to, I sort of want to say on this particular topic is one of the subtleties, because we brought up metamaterials. I've, I'm bringing this up in a talk about metamaterials. And so far, I've just said, well, I'm just going to shoot two beams at one another and sort of superpose them. How is that anything to do with metamaterials? How's that useful? And this comes down to something reasonably fundamental which is the time reversibility of Maxwell's equations. And to some extent, causality in physics will pretend, uh, or determinism in physics will pretend uh, quantum theory doesn't exist. Um, and it's this idea that um, in terms of the electric field, at the very least, every call or electric field and magnetic fields, ignoring quantum stuff, every field, every cause has a particular effect. Um, if you know the state of the system at one point in time, you can always predict the state of the system at a later point in time. Uh, there's, a, there's one cause has exactly one effect. But there's also the relationship that uh, in implied by time reversibility that every effect has exactly one cause, because if you just sw swap time around, you get the same thing. And so if every effect is exactly one cause and every cause is exactly one effect, then there's a one-to-one -one relationship which gives you a problem if you're trying to superimpose two beams and get another beam out. Because any way I can do it, let's imagine I, let's take my X or gate, for example, and we'll say that we want it to output zero when both things are on. We already know it's outputting zero when neither thing is on. And therefore, output the output of zero, there's no time reversibility there. If you have an output of zero, you have no way of knowing whether it, the gate was initially on or whether it was initially off. And also, if you think about it, if you're just superimposing these two waves as they come together, where's the energy going? If you're getting a zero electric field out, there's power being moved into a zero electric field region. Where's that power going? And so it turns out that the only way of actually truly superimposing two things is if you have some loss associated with the system. And that loss gives you the time reversibility. It gives you the fact that if energy's um, it lets you distinguish between the two zero outputs because in one output your resistance has absorbed some energy in one output it hasn't and so that's a brief introduction to the second field i was really interested to i was really interested with and we're running out of time but there's i'd like to discuss just vaguely uh where i'm at at the moment and what i'm doing at the moment so i spent a long time looking at linear optical computing before eventually realizing seriously late that there's just this fundamental restriction that optical that logic gates are fundamentally non-linear and in fact turing machines in general are fundamentally non-linear non which means because they have the requirement of some degree of branching and if you have branching logic you can always implement an and gate and we know 
or an XOR gate, and we know XOR gates are inherently nonlinear. So there's no way of sort of comp compounding things and compo compounding these linear optical logic gates into a larger thing, into a full computer. But that doesn't mean there isn't any, there isn't a possibility, because electricity is great at programming a Turing machine uh, or great at implementing a Turing machine. Light, however, is really, really good at solving wave equations. Um, and this gives us something known as metaphoric computing, um, which is the idea that you use the fact that light is very good at acting like a wave to try and simulate something that acts a lot like a wave. And in particular, I started this entire thing by looking at holography. Got distracted for a year looking at linear optical computing, but it brought me back because by the end I realized linear optics is fundamentally limited to linear operations. We can't build a Turing machine, we can't build a general computer. But what we can manage to do is predict how light will move. And effectively, that's all holography is. So, uh, so now for the past year or so, I've now been looking at, um, at turning this to holography. And hopefully at some point I can, um, I'll be able to say, uh, maybe in a future talk, that I've succeeded. Haven't yet. Well, I've got ideas, haven't finished them. But um, I hope this has given you a vague idea of optical method materials, because I think these are amazing. They've, they gave me one way of doing holography, found it was implausible. They've given me another way of doing it. They've shown me linear optical computing. It's, it's a huge field, and I think it's just amazing that it, it just really showcases the power of physics, that we can, just by really, really understanding the physical laws and physical systems at play, we can do something so weird so weird like having a negative arbitrarily negative arbitrarily complex i mean to the limit you can construct resonators for these things high low refractive indices you can do all of this i think is quite amazing so if there are any questions i'd be happy to answer them um on yep there's a slide saying any questions yeah. thank you very yeah. much for listening and my uh, contact details are on the last slide if you don't want to ask them now and want to email me or contact me on Discord. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if that sound of passing made it through. Um, it's it's just vaguely you. disordered. Um, that was an excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Um, I, Kieran is making some sort of, oh, that's a clapping, that's a clapping thing. Okay. Um, does anybody um, have any questions? Um, I start out. Uh, either you can unmute yourself or you can uh, send it in the chat and I'll read it out. Um, and perhaps while we do this, I do have a question for you. Brilliant. Um, first of all, um, regarding the linear optical computing, um, could you not for, so it's clear if you have one output, you, you can't, uh, because of time reversibility, you can't have two kinds of input. Um, but couldn't you have like an additional output? So you have, you have two beams coming in, two beams coming out, and you just forget about one of the two beams coming out. Yeah. Um, similar to how you do in quantum computing, where you're also limited by the same unitarity. Um, yeah, I was, I was about to say, because I've got a friend who's very interested in quantum com computing. So the time reversibility of Maxwell's equations isn't what is forcing you to have this. Uh, is it, because what you're suggesting sounds like um, instead of an XOR gate, why don't I imp implement a CNOX gate? And the answer to that would yeah. be it's the linearity that's causing a problem. The C not, the C, you could implement a CNOX gate and that would be perfectly allowable. Um, and you could then sort of forget one of the outputs from this uh, from the C not gate. So for those of you who don't know, a C not gate is it's an XOR gate, but you have two outputs, and one of the outputs was just one of the inputs. It's known as a controlled not gate because it's where you have whether or not it acts as a not gate is determined by one of the inputs. Um, and so basically, the limitation is not time reversibility; it's the linearity and the fact that XOR okay. gates etc are fundamentally non-linear which is why we okay. need to use intensity measurements because that squares things in order to actually get um, a response from them that helps okay. um thank you very much um we have a chat from rory uh rory yeah um probably a stupid question but why does the negative permeability imply a negative refractive index um 
or what and why are the conditions? Um, yep. Yeah, so you know, so I very quickly skimmed over that. Um, so yeah, why why should why should this be an implication? And so the um, the simple answer is, I've I've read papers where it's true. Um, the the slightly longer answer is, I so the. So within a particular medium, if you're just watching a wave propagating in a single medium, you can't tell whether the, me whether the refractive index of that medium is positive or negative. You could only tell that by looking at how it moves from one medium to another. So for all we know, air could have a negative refractive index and my negative index metamaterials could have a positive refractive index and we would never be able to tell the difference. Now, assuming air does have a positive refractive index because that makes life significantly easier, um, the way we'd determine um, the negative refractive index of a second material is how the light basically changes when it enters it. And so it's this motion that's really indicative of that. And the way you'd go about solving that is you'd, uh, you'd solve the interface conditions of electric fields, which are to do with the continuity of the waves, uh, of the waves of the mediums. But there is um, to do with the continuity of the electric field along um, uh, within the plane of the boundary, and it's to do with the continuity of the D field um, moving between the two boundaries. And it's that continuity of the D field, uh, which off the top of my head, I would expect pulls you back in the other direction, um, if that makes any sense. Um, I've just lost the main judge. Oh, no, there it is. He got back. Um, good, very good question. <laughs> Um, what about uh, any other questions from, from the chat? Anyone want to brave microphone? Usually nonlinear optics require high power uh, from Angelus uh, Somalis. Usually nonlinear optics require high power. Um, do you have a feeling how to deal with that when you have, a, uh, have cascade metamaterials in terms of losses? Okay, so I've been, there's a reason I've been very heavily looking at uh, holography via the idea of uh, look at you doing holography via non um, via linear optical computing rather than trying to get cascading logic gates because yeah we have this problem of extremely high power um, I've I mean so one of the interesting things that I found and in particular the C not gate question earlier was quite prescient for this um, because in order to excite in order so Let's imagine just as a simple model for a, for something nonlinear. Um, what happens if we take a uh, if we use as our sort of nonlinearity a gain medium that's being pumped by a laser? The gain medium will only be active if the laser is on pumping it. But we can have the uh, we can have the la uh, the beam traveling through that will receive the same gain and it will receive a linear gain no matter what the intensity of the powering laser is. So, but the other interesting thing is the, is basically you're going to have a lot of the intensity from that, from that pumping beam may well not, may well just continue passing through. And so if we wanted to cascade metamaterials, my main, th my main thought would be, to try something like the CNOS approach, have the control beam be the one that's required to extremely high power. Now, the issues with this are that, well, we can't guarantee there. There are the seconds we have the the any one of the beams being in particular constantly nonlinear. There's like we can't guarantee we'll be able to activate nonlinear effects later on. So, and for instance, we then have the problem of how do we so a lot of the intensity um, has been lost as the nonlinear beam has just passed through, and we can't use that intense uh, the C not control beam has just passed through, and we can't use that intensity later, right? Because we don't, we there's no guarantee it'll be there. Um, so we'd have to find some way of guaranteeing it'll be there. One way you could do that, which is, uh, would be to have a would be to have a C not that's controlled controlled in inverted commas by three beams um one of them is it is directly plugged into the c knot and one of them is the knot of that beam so either the beam is plugged into the c knot or it's traveling sort of parallel to the c knot and you could in theory 
use those beams, you can guarantee one of those beams will always be on. You have issues with the fact that in require uh, that those beams have to be on two different, completely different channels, and in order to make use of their intensity, you'd have to plug them into a game medium or something like that. But if you wanted to cascade meta materials, that's I've been thinking about that recently, and that's what I've been thinking about if you wanted to move into nonlinear optics. If that made any sense whatsoever, because <laughs> I do feel like I'm rambling yeah. on stuff like that. Um, we have some typing in the chat. Yeah, yeah, thanks. No <laughs> worries. Um, we have more typing. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, uh, please feel very free to write them. Um, I'm waiting in excitement. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I okay. Uh, nice. Um, okay. Uh, so he says, "Nice talk, Calvin. Thank you." Um, um, I agree with him. It was a very, very nice talk. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, looking very for. I'm looking forward to. I think there's a third year course on where they briefly mention optical mesh materials, and okay. I, I look forward to uh, to being prepared for that. Um, I think, uh, and also just in general, um, I find the analog with uh, with this linear optical computing and quantum computing. It seems they have some of the same kind of restrictions, which I yeah. which I'll take with me. Um, yeah, but I've I've been talking about that a, that a lot with uh, the friend I mentioned who's very into quantum computers because it does because linear mm -hmm. optical quantum computing is a nice. Uh, is a topic it's i believe currently limited by basically um the fact you need to implement non-linearity somehow the easiest way of doing yeah. that is by having what like a photon multiplier tube or using non-linear optics but non-linear optics requires high powers and almost nothing uh gets the effect you want and photon multiplier tubes um have dark counts that's my understanding of the field at the moment okay Yes, thank you very much then. Uh, I you. will adjourn this first cult. Uh, I, I thought it was a great success. Uh, if anyone has any um, has any thoughts, uh, feel free to send it to co-chairs. Uh, and you were willing to answer questions if they send yep. them to you as well, right? Yeah, I'd okay. love to. Then I am pausing the recording now.